All right, welcome to uh, session seven in uh, our church history journey. So glad you're all here tonight. I'm honored that you took time out of your week to listen to my ramblings for an hour or however long it winds up being. <laughs> my wife's looking at me. Um, we are learning a lot. We're in some pivotal moments. I have heard from several people that couldn't be here for work obligations and other things. They say they're joining online. I don't believe them, um, but they might be. If they are, that's great. Uh, we are recording these for those of you that would like to take advantage of the full length of the, um, <clears throat> of the class. They're going to be available on YouTube, and we'll have all of them saved for you in a playlist. So if you want to take advantage of that, you can. Um, before we pray, I want to read you something just because of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and really the whole, we're, for those of you that are <clears throat> new to the study, we're in the middle of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, we kind of kicked off, we did a precursor to the Reformation. Last week we did the first generation reformers with um, uh, Martin Luther and uh, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, those of you that were there for that. Now we're in what people call the second generation reformers. And um, <clears throat> I know it's hard to express, um, but th this is the season of church history that greatly shapes your existence today as a Christian. Um, we're going to talk about things that have bearings on your everyday life, um, or they should at least. And so with that in mind, uh, tonight we're going to specifically talk about one of the main doctrinal issues of the Reformation, which is the doctrine of um, justification. And while we talk about that, I want you to keep a few verses in mind. I think it's right to read God's Word um, in general, but... <laughs> When we're, even when we're talking about <clears throat> church history, if you have a Bible, you can look in Romans 3, uh, 28. I want you to keep this in mind. Paul is, the whole book of Romans is a book explaining the gospel. And he says in Romans 3, uh, 28, just a quick verse, he, he's been making this argument and he gives a summary <clears throat> in verse 28 where he says, for we hold, talking about him and the apostles, we hold that one is justified, a person is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. That's a theme that runs through the whole Bible. I want you to wrestle with what that means. A person is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. What does Paul mean? And we could do a study of Romans to work that out. But you can also look over in five, chapter 5, verse 1. In light of everything he's been arguing and explaining, he says, Therefore, since we have been, believers, since we have been justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We obtain access to this grace by faith, not by works of the law. We're going to see how those few verses, <clears throat> and really the whole book of Romans and the gospel itself, was at the heart of a lot of the splits that took place in the Reformation. So we're starting tonight in session 7, which we're calling Reformation Contested. Reformation Contested. We're going to talk about Calvin, John Calvin, and the Council of Trent. So we're covering a, a, a big swath of time here, period here. But this is what many people call the second generation of the Reformation. So I'll always give you a main point tonight is uh, this. Despite the clarity of the reformational doctrines as taught by John Calvin and others, Martin Luther and <clears throat> the other reformers, the Roman Catholic Church responded at the Council of Trent by focusing on structural rather than doctrinal problems, entrenching existing errors, and further cementing the differences between Protestantism and Rome. So, anybody, anybody ever heard of the Council of Trent before? Okay, several. It's a pretty cataclysmic moment in general world history, but specifically in the church history of what we're considering tonight. So, a few goals for you, three mainly. First of all, 
Uh, we're going to try and introduce John Calvin, the person, the historical figure known as John Calvin, as a humble and patient reformer whose life was subdued to the will of God. We'll spend kind of the first part of our discussion talking about him. He's pretty central to the whole central second generation of reformers. There are other reformers for sure, but um, historically he's kind of the monolith that emerges, the cataclysmic figure that um, does so much writing and has a huge impact on uh, Western history. Two, we're going to explain the political and the social turmoil within Europe that caused the delay in calling the Council of Trent until 1546. You'll see why that's important. It took forever to call this thing. We're going to talk about why. And then thirdly and lastly, we're going to elucidate the central doctrinal decisions, doctrinal decisions of the Council of Trent, including their affirmation of the so-called wide canon, if you've ever heard that term, which included the Apocrypha, and uh, the affirmation of what they call oral tradition as an equally authoritative mode of revelation and justification as an ongoing sacramental process rather than a particular event. I know there's some big words, but everyone stay with me. They're important. So let's start with, I'm going to move fast because I want, we got a lot to talk about, and I don't want to linger. So forgive me if I'm not as uh, uh, verbose as normal. Um, John Calvin. Let's start with uh, this guy here. Everybody knows John Calvin, the long pointy beard. Uh, he lived between 1509 and 1564. So I'm going to give you a survey of his life. Some of it, it should all be printed in your handout if you want to jot down notes. We're going to move somewhat fast, and then we can, I think I might take a mid-pause for some discussion in, in the middle. First of all, he's born in a little town called Noyon in France uh, to a well-to-do father who paid for him to be educated as a priest. Uh, that was a good... Um, career back in those days, well-paying. His father sends him off to be a priest. Uh, he switches degree paths, however, in the middle of his priesthood training in favor of becoming a lawyer. His father actually had a falling out with the local bishop, and they excommunicated him. So uh, he decided, ah, maybe I should be a lawyer instead. So he switches the law. He gives all of his efforts to that. And then while he's in law school in the University of Paris, uh, he is radically converted to the Christian faith, um, to faith in Christ, around 1533 in the city of Orléans. Now, um, when I say converted to the Christian faith, he was obviously a Roman Catholic. Uh, born and raised, he was studying to be a Roman Catholic priest. But he was exposed to many individuals that were preaching the gospel that, of justification, which had been recently spread by, you know, in a, just a few years before, by men like Martin Luther. And so he hears this, and he, he talks about these men, and it's interesting to note what I'm about to show you is he, he, Calvin didn't do a lot of talking about himself. We have to learn everything we know about Calvin from other people because Calvin wouldn't really write anything down. He didn't like to talk about himself. He was a very quiet, uh, reserved man and very humble man. And so the little few times he wrote about himself, once he wrote a commentary on Psalms, and he wrote an introduction to that commentary and mentioned a little bit about his conversion experience. And this is part of what he had to say. And I want you to know that he had three or four major influences in his life during this time as a college student. Protestant pastors who illegally brought the gospel to him, and he heard it preached. But instead of mentioning their names, this is actually how, in the way only Calvin could. Now this. He's what? Okay. I've already pressed it. All right. Welcome to uh, session seven in uh, our church history journey. So glad you're all here tonight. I'm honored that you took time out of your week to listen to my ramblings for an hour or however long it winds up being. <laughs> my wife's looking at me. Um, we are learning a lot. We're in some pivotal moments. I have heard from several people that couldn't be here for work obligations and other things. They say they're joining online. I don't believe them, um, but they might be. If they are, that's great. Uh, we are recording these. For those of you that would like to take advantage of the full length of the, um, <clears throat> of the class, they're going to be available on YouTube, and we'll have all of them saved for you in a playlist. So if you want to take advantage of that, you can. Um, before we pray, I want to read you something just because of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, and really the whole, for those of you that are <clears throat> new to the study, 
we're in the middle of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, we kind of kicked off, we did a precursor to the Reformation. Last week we did the first generation reformers with um, uh, Martin Luther and uh, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, those of you that were there for that. Now we're in what people call the second generation reformers. And um, <clears throat> I know it's hard to express, um, but the, this is the season of church history that greatly shapes your existence today as a Christian. Um, we're going to talk about things that have bearings on your everyday life, um, or they should at least. And so with that in mind, uh, tonight we're going to specifically talk about one of the main doctrinal issues of the Reformation, which is the doctrine of um, justification. And while we talk about that, I want you to keep a few verses in mind. I think it's right to read God's Word um, in general, but... <laughs> When we're, even when we're talking about <clears throat> church history, if you have a Bible, you can look in Romans 3, uh, 28. I want you to keep this in mind. Paul is, the whole book of Romans is a book explaining the gospel. And he says in Romans 3, uh, 28, just a quick verse, he, he's been making this argument and he gives a summary <clears throat> in verse 28 where he says, for we hold, talking about him and the apostles, we hold that one is justified, a person is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. That's a theme that runs through the whole Bible. I want you to wrestle with what that means. A person is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. What does Paul mean? And we could do a study of Romans to work that out. But you can also look over in five, chapter 5, verse 1. In light of everything he's been arguing and explaining, he says, Therefore, since we have been, believers, since we have been justified by what? Faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We obtain access to this grace by faith, not by works of the law. We're going to see how those few verses, <clears throat> and really the whole book of Romans and the gospel itself, was at the heart of a lot of the splits that took place in the Reformation. So before we begin, let's pray, and then we'll jump in here. Lord, we thank you for your goodness to us in Christ. Uh, we pray that you would guide our words tonight and our thoughts as we give them over to you, as we try and think about your church and how you have providentially and sovereignly protected it over the years through all of its turmoil, all of its schism, all of its... Uh, rebellion and frustration and confusion, we are still here, miraculously, 2,000 years later. Um, we pray that we would cling to the true and historic gospel and that we would find it in your word. We love you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're starting tonight in session seven, which we're calling Reformation Contested. Reformation Contested. We're going to talk about Calvin, John Calvin, and the Council of Trent. So we're covering a, a, a big swath of time here, period here, but this is what many people call the second generation of the Reformation. So I'll always give you a main point tonight is uh, this. Despite the clarity of the Reformational doctrines as taught by John Calvin and others, Martin Luther and <clears throat> the other Reformers, the Roman Catholic Church responded at the Council of Trent by focusing on structural rather than doctrinal problems, entrenching existing errors, and further cementing the differences between Protestantism and Rome. So anybody, anybody ever heard of the Council of Trent before? Okay, several. It's a pretty cataclysmic moment in general world history, but specifically in the church history of what we're considering tonight. So a few goals for you, three mainly. First of all, uh, we're going to try and introduce John Calvin, the person, the historical figure known as John Calvin, as a humble and patient reformer whose life was subdued to the will of God. We'll spend kind of the first part of our discussion 
talking about him. He's pretty central to the whole central second generation of reformers. There are other reformers for sure, but um, historically he's kind of the monolith that emerges, the cataclysmic figure that um, does so much writing and has a huge impact on uh, Western history. Two, we're going to explain the political and the social turmoil within Europe that caused the delay in calling the Council of Trent until 1546. You'll see why that's important. It took forever to call this thing. We're going to talk about why. And then thirdly and lastly, we're going to elucidate the central doctrinal decisions, doctrinal decisions of the Council of Trent, including their affirmation of the so-called wide canon, if you've ever heard that term, which included the Apocrypha, and uh, the affirmation of what they call oral tradition as an equally authoritative mode of revelation and justification as an ongoing sacramental process rather than a particular event. I know there's some big words, but everyone stay with me. They're important. So let's start with, I'm going to move fast because I want, we got a lot to talk about, and I don't want to linger. So forgive me if I'm not as uh, uh, verbose as normal. Um, John Calvin. Let's start with uh, this guy here. Everybody knows John Calvin, the long pointy beard. Uh, he lived between 1509 and 1564. So I'm going to give you a survey of his life. Some of it, it should all be printed in your handout if you want to jot down notes. We're going to move somewhat fast, and then we can, I think I might take a mid-pause for some discussion in, in the middle. First of all, he's born in a little town called Noyon in France uh, to a well-to-do father who paid for him to be educated as a priest. Uh, that was a good... Um, career back in those days, well-paying. His father sends him off to be a priest. Uh, he switches degree paths, however, in the middle of his priesthood training in favor of becoming a lawyer. His father actually had a falling out with the local bishop, and they excommunicated him. So uh, he decided, oh, maybe I should be a lawyer instead. So he switches the law. He gives all of his efforts to that. And then while he's in law school in the University of Paris, uh, he is radically converted to the Christian faith, um, to faith in Christ, around 1533 in the city of Orléans. Now, um, when I say converted to the Christian faith, he was obviously a Roman Catholic. Uh, born and raised, he was studying to be a Roman Catholic priest. But he was exposed to many individuals that were preaching the gospel that, of justification, which had been recently spread by, you know, in a, just a few years before, by men like Martin Luther. And so he hears this, and he, he talks about these men, and it's interesting to note what I'm about to show you is he, he, Calvin didn't do a lot of talking about himself. We have to learn everything we know about Calvin from other people because Calvin wouldn't really write anything down. He didn't like to talk about himself. He was a very quiet, uh, reserved man and very humble man. And so the little few times he wrote about himself, once he wrote a commentary on Psalms, and he wrote an introduction to that commentary and mentioned a little bit about his conversion experience. And this is part of what he had to say. And I want you to know that he had three or four major influences in his life during this time as a college student. Protestant pastors who illegally brought the gospel to him, and he heard it preached. But instead of mentioning their names, this is actually how, in the way only Calvin could, uh, this is how he describes his conversion. I've got it on the screen for you. And I think it's printed in your handout. He said, Thus it came to pass that I was put to the study of law. He became a lawyer. And to this pursuit, I endeavored faithfully to apply myself in obedience to the will of my Father. But God, God, by the secret guidance of his providence, at length gave a different direction to my course. And first, since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstitions of popery to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire. <laughs> what a way to say something. God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so intense a desire to make progress therein that although I did not altogether leave off other studies, I yet pursued them with less ardor. 
So he doesn't mention any of these guys that shared the gospel to him. Uh, he doesn't really attribute any of it to them. As John Calvin likes to do, he attributes it all to God. The only person he really names, those men in his life were secondary means, right? Um, but God was the main actor in his salvation, and you should take that to account for your own story as well. There may have been people that shared the gospel with you. You may have read books written by other people, but the main actor behind your salvation, the author of it, has always been God. If you're a believer, it's because God has orchestrated this divine salvation. So that's how Calvin is uh, converted around 1533, and then he flees uh, he can't stay in the University of Paris for long. Things get kind of rough. So he flees France uh, and goes to Basel and, uh, in Switzerland. And he begins writing a book that most of you might have heard of. This is what he's known for. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. That's the name of the book. Now, the Institutes of the Christian Religion um, is one of the most famous books in history. Like if you're required to read things in philosophy or theology, you have to read the Institutes if, you, if you're Protestant or not because it was, it's a huge book. First of all, it's about that thick. I have it in my office. Um, and it's also foundational because basically what it was was you had all these people knowing now that they're not Catholic, right? They disagree with the Catholic uh, position on justification and the way... Salvation works. But all you really have from the Lutheran crowd is you have a few, like you have the Augsburg Confession and a few catechisms. That's about it. There's a few other things that, you know, Luther had written several books and stuff like that. But there's not a huge body of Protestant writings yet. So everyone in Europe was saying, look, we need somebody to come along and codify and simplify all of these different things in down, down to, well, what, what is Protestant Christianity? What is historic? What is this Christianity that they're cr claiming is historic that connects back to its early roots? And that basically was what John Calvin gave himself over to in writing the Institutes. That's what that means. The, it could be also called the doctrines of the Christian religion, the Institutes of the Christian religion. What does the Christian religion believe? And it's really a systematic theology. It's just an explaining of the basics. And I encourage you to read it. It's a, um, it's a slow read at times. You've got to kind of you know, work through it. And he wrote it over like a 40-year period. So it wasn't, you know, just wrote it overnight. Um, but he started his first edition he released at the age of 26. It's converted at 25. So 26, he's already writing this massive book. Well, immediately overnight, it makes him pretty well known in the, really all of Europe, but especially the Protestant world. And so he writes that book at 26. Um, casually, he's traveling. He has to stop one night to spend one night, is all he planned, just spend one night in a little town called Geneva. Anybody been to Geneva? Me and my wife have, you know. Uh, it's a beautiful city if you ever get to go. But Geneva, Switzerland, you might know it for the Geneva Convention. Um, uh, Geneva, Switzerland is kind of a symbol of modern peace. It's where world leaders meet and stuff like that. Geneva was a, a, a smaller city in his day, obviously, but it became more and more important, as you'll see, largely from his own influence. But <clears throat> he stops in this little town called Geneva, only going to stay the night, and he's compelled to minister there by this man named William Farrell. Now, Farrell is a reformer like Calvin, um, but Farrell is much older than Calvin, and, and Farrell is like a fire and brimstone type of, type of guy, and I mean that in the best po possible sense. He was, a, he was excited, charismatic, well-spoken, you know, uh, energized type of guy. And he had a passion for Geneva. Well, if you know anything about Calvin, Calvin was small, frail, shy, highly anxious, and uh, his, his stomach easily irritated. Like, he's a very fragile dude. Like, he's very, very shy. He's nothing like Pharrell. Okay, two totally different personalities. But one thing Calvin is, is he was an intellect. He was an academician. Like, he was brilliant. Um, and Pharrell saw these talents in Calvin, and he really wanted Calvin to stay in Geneva and help the Protestants reform Geneva. And it's interesting to note that Calvin says, well, that's not my interest. I'm not called, I don't feel like I'm really a pastor or theologian or anything. I really want to go up in the mountains, and he just wants to give himself to theology and just write books and just basically become a nerd for a living, okay? Become a professor for a living. Uh, which, there's an appeal to that, by the way. Um, but Pharrell, this charismatic figure, stops Calvin, and he gets so irate. 
that Calvin will not listen to him. He actually, he, he tells Calvin that I will pray that God himself will curse you and all of your endeavors, every book you write, if you do not stay here and help Christ's church here in Geneva. And Calvin records that he was so shocked and so overcome by the passion of this man, Pharrell, that Calvin agrees. He decides to stay and assist Pharrell and assist the Protestant church in Geneva who had just recently ejected their Catholic bishop and had decided to be Protestant. And so he decides to, to stay. Sadly, things don't go super well. There's some victories, uh, but if you've been in the work of reform at all, if you've ever preached the gospel to lost people or to people, that, especially people that think they're Christian, and uh, they're not really, you're starting to learn they don't really have a lot of clarity on the gospel and you're trying to bring the gospel into their life, it can stir waters. It can create problems. Well, it happens with Pharrell and Calvin. Um, they are actually exiled from Geneva over some church governance issues. Now, uh, you're like, church governance issues, that sounds boring. Well, it's actually pretty fascinating. They, they started reading the Bible. Y'all remember, that's a new thing for the Reformation. And they started reading the Bible, and at that time, all the cities in, in Switzerland were independent city-states called cantons. And the canton of Geneva, the city-state of Geneva, uh, had a city council, was how it was ruled. And that city council had taken on itself, when they expelled the bishop, they had taken on, on themselves the right to excommunicate people from the church. So it would be like our city council in Greenville having the right to excommunicate one of y'all from Emmanuel. It's just like completely disconnected, right? But because... In order to be a, a, basically a citizen in Geneva because it was a Christian city, um, you had to have membership in a church. And the state church, they were going to kick you out. There was a marriage of church and state. Remember, that's how it worked in that time. And Calvin comes along and Farrell, and they're like, um, this is a problem. We, we, can't, we can't function as pastors if we have people in our congregation who are sleeping around on their wives or abusing their children and yet they're coming to the table, and we can't excommunicate them. We can't tell them they can't come. We can't church discipline them because y'all have to church discipline them. And guess what? The city council ain't going to church discipline the millionaire that pays his taxes. Okay? So they ran into this problem. They said, look, we got to have, and, and f to, to their credit, they, Pharrell, remember I said, was boisterous and loud. He was a little more pushy, and Calvin wanted to kind of take it a little slower and they pushed it a little too fast, a little too quick. And so the Geneva Council voted to exile them. And they kick them out of the city. So they're sent away, sent off into exile, and they move to the city of Strasbourg and learn under a man named Martin Bootser. Now, Martin Bootser is a huge figure. I encourage you to read a biography on him. But he basically mentors Calvin as a young man. So Calvin might have been a little... Uh, this is how he describes his conversion. I've got it on the screen for you, and I think it's printed in your handout. He said, Thus it came to pass that I was put to the study of law. He became a lawyer. And to this pursuit, I endeavored faithfully to apply myself in obedience to the will of my Father. But God, God, by the secret guidance of his providence, at length gave a different direction to my course. And first, since I was too obstinately devoted to the superstitions of popery to be easily extricated from so profound an abyss of mire. <laughs> what a way to say something. God, by a sudden conversion, subdued and brought my mind to a teachable frame, which was more hardened in such matters than might have been expected from one at my early period of life. Having thus received some taste and knowledge of true godliness, I was immediately inflamed with so intense a desire to make progress therein that although I did not altogether leave off other studies, I yet pursued them with less ardor. So he doesn't mention any of these guys that shared the gospel to him. Uh, he doesn't really attribute any of it to them. As John Calvin likes to do, he attributes it all to God. The only person he really names 
Those men in his life were secondary means, right? Um, but God was the main actor in his salvation, and you should take that to count for your own story as well. There may have been people that shared the gospel with you. You may have read books written by other people, but the main actor behind your salvation, the author of it, has always been God. If you're a believer, it's because God has orchestrated this divine salvation. So that's how Calvin is uh, converted around 1533, and then he flees uh, he can't stay in the University of Paris for long. Things get kind of rough. So he flees France uh, and goes to Basel and, uh, in Switzerland. And he begins writing a book that most of you might have heard of. This is what he's known for. The Institutes of the Christian Religion. That's the name of the book. Now, The Institutes of the Christian Religion um, is one of the most famous books in history. Like if you're required to read things in philosophy or theology, you have to read the Institutes if, you, if you're Protestant or not because it was, it's a huge book. First of all, it's about that thick. I have it in my office. Um, and it's also foundational because basically what it was was you had all these people knowing now that they're not Catholic, right? They disagree with the Catholic uh, position on justification and the way... Salvation works. But all you really have from the Lutheran crowd is you have a few, like you have the Augsburg Confession and a few catechisms. That's about it. There's a few other things that, you know, Luther had written several books and stuff like that. But there's not a huge body of Protestant writings yet. So everyone in Europe was saying, look, we need somebody to come along and codify and simplify all of these different things in down, down to, well, what, what is Protestant Christianity? What is historic? What is this Christianity that they're cr claiming is historic that connects back to its early roots? And that basically was what John Calvin gave himself over to in writing the Institutes. That's what that means. The, it could be also called the doctrines of the Christian religion, the Institutes of the Christian religion. What does the Christian religion believe? And it's really a systematic theology. It's just an explaining of the basics. And I encourage you to read it. It's a, uh, it's a slow read at times. You've got to kind of you know, work through it. And he wrote it over like a 40-year period. So it wasn't, you know, just wrote it overnight. Um, but he started his first edition he released at the age of 26. He's converted at 25. So 26, he's already writing this massive book. Well, immediately overnight, it makes him pretty well known in the, really all of Europe, but especially the Protestant world. And so he writes that book at 26. Um, casually, he's traveling. He has to stop one night to spend one night, is all he planned, just spend one night in a little town called Geneva. Anybody been to Geneva? Me and my wife have, you know. Uh, it's a beautiful city if you ever get to go. But Geneva, Switzerland, you might know it for the Geneva Convention. Um, uh, Geneva, Switzerland is kind of a symbol of modern peace. It's where world leaders meet and stuff like that. Geneva was a, a, a smaller city in his day, obviously, but it became more and more important, as you'll see, largely from his own influence. But <clears throat> he stops in this little town called Geneva, only going to stay the night, and he's compelled to minister there by this man named William Farrell. Now, Farrell is a reformer like Calvin, um, but Farrell is much older than Calvin, and, and Farrell is like a fire and brimstone type of, type of guy, and I mean that in the best po possible sense. He was, a, he was excited, charismatic, well-spoken, you know, uh, energized type of guy. And he had a passion for Geneva. Well, if you know anything about Calvin, Calvin was small, frail, shy, highly anxious, and uh, his, his stomach easily irritated. Like, he's a very fragile dude. Like, he's very, very shy. He's nothing like Pharrell. Okay, two totally different personalities. But one thing Calvin is, is he was an intellect. He was an academician. Like, he was brilliant. Um, and Pharrell saw these talents in Calvin, and he really wanted Calvin to stay in Geneva and help the Protestants reform Geneva. And it's interesting to note that Calvin says, well, that's not my interest. I'm not called, I don't feel like I'm really a pastor or a theologian or anything. I really want to go up in the mountains. And he just wants to give himself to theology and just write books and just basically become a nerd for a living, okay? Become a professor for a living. Uh, which, there's an appeal to that, by the way. Um, but Pharrell, this charismatic figure, stops Calvin, and he gets so irate that Calvin will not listen to him. He actually, he, he tells Calvin that I will pray that God himself will curse you and all of your endeavors 
every book you write if you do not stay here and help Christ's church here in Geneva. And Calvin records that he was so shocked and so overcome by the passion of this man, Pharrell, that Calvin agrees. He decides to stay and assist Pharrell and assist the Protestant church in Geneva who had just recently ejected their Catholic bishop and had decided to be Protestant. And so he decides to, to stay. Sadly, things don't go super well. There's some victories, uh, but if you've been in the work of reform at all, if you've ever preached the gospel to lost people or to people that, especially people that think they're Christian, and uh, they're not really, you're starting to learn they don't really have a lot of clarity on the gospel, and you're trying to bring the gospel into their life, it can stir waters. It can create problems. Well, it happens with Pharrell and Calvin. Um, they are actually exiled from Geneva over some church governance issues. Now, uh, you're like, church governance issues, that sounds boring. Well, it's actually pretty fascinating. They, they started reading the Bible. Y'all remember, that's a new thing for the Reformation. And they started reading the Bible, and at that time, all the cities in, in Switzerland were independent city-states called cantons. And the canton of Geneva, the city-state of Geneva, uh, had a city council, was how it was ruled. And that city council had taken on itself, when they expelled the bishop, they had taken on, on themselves the right to excommunicate people from the church. So it would be like our city council in Greenville having the right to excommunicate one of y'all from Emmanuel. It's just like completely disconnected, right? But because... In order to be a, a, basically a citizen in Geneva because it was a Christian city, um, you had to have membership in a church. And the state church, they were going to kick you out. There was a marriage of church and state. Remember, that's how it worked in that time. And Calvin comes along and Farrell, and they're like, um, this is a problem. We, we, can't, we can't function as pastors if we have people in our congregation who are sleeping around on their wives or abusing their children and yet they're coming to the table, and we can't excommunicate them. We can't tell them they can't come. We can't church discipline them because y'all have to church discipline them. And guess what? The city council ain't going to church discipline the millionaire that pays his taxes. Okay? So they ran into this problem. They said, look, we got to have, and, and f to, to their credit, they, Pharrell, remember I said, was boisterous and loud. He was a little more pushy, and Calvin wanted to kind of take it a little slower and they pushed it a little too fast, a little too quick. And so the Geneva Council voted to exile them. And they kick them out of the city. So they're sent away, sent off into exile, and they move to the city of Strasbourg and learn under a man named Martin Bootser. Now, Martin Bootser is a huge figure. I encourage you to read a biography on him. But he basically mentors Calvin as a young man. So Calvin might have been a little more, as all young people are, a little more... You know, let's go, let's do it, you know, and uh, a little more brash maybe. And under Bootser in Strasbourg, Bootser's an older man, an older pastor. And he, he nurtures Pharrell and especially Calvin as a young man and kind of trains him how to be a more godly, kind, gentle shepherd, a gentle reformer. And Calvin learns so much. Calvin actually says this is his happiest moment of his life. He's married... Um, to his sweetheart, uh, Idolette is her name. Uh, he never really wanted to get married, and then he randomly found Idolette, and they fell in love, and they got married. And uh, they had a baby. Uh, it's sad that they only had one baby. He was a son, and he died at 21 days old. Uh, he didn't live very long. And then Idolette dies a few years afterwards, and Calvin is widowed at the age of 40, a young man. Um, it absolutely wrecked his life. Uh, he, he, like most of the reformers, uh, I think any serious Christian, uh, had seasons of doubt and depression. And um, a lot of modern thinkers think he struggled with crippling anxiety. Um, this sent him into a spiral, very dark season of his life. He tells some people in a letter he wrote, he said he doesn't know how he's going to live. He feels like he's in a pit, a mire. Um, and, but he trusted in God's sovereignty. He, he knew that God allowed it to happen. He didn't understand why, and he didn't like it. It was his baby and his wife. Uh, and he loved God, and he didn't know why God allowed it, but he trusted in God's goodness and in God's wisdom. And God sustained him 
through a terrible, terrible season of depression um, in Strasbourg. And then eventually, uh, when he thought his life might end, God wasn't done with him. He endures that terrible trial. He's a widower, and just like Paul, who they think was probably a widower, um, Paul was able to give himself completely to the work of the gospel, the gift of singleness, right? It was the same for Calvin. Calvin's now single. He's a brilliant intellect. He's a great academician. He's a good writer. So now he's single, and he has no child. He, he pours himself into the work of the ministry. And it's sad to note that a lot of his critics of the day, especially his Roman Catholic critics, um, mocked him for being childless and for God letting his wife die. They used that as a, um, a suggestion that God didn't approve of his ministry and that God was judging him. And he was made fun of. He was a slight man. He was very small, very thin, very fragile. Um, and then he loses his wife and his son, and he's, he was just mocked for that. And it was a sad time. But... Through that crucible, God really forged a great man that endured in the face of really terrible circumstances. And we see that in the next part because in 1541, in a miraculous turn of events, he's actually called back to Geneva by the council. You say, whoa, what in the world? Well, again, you've got to remember, the Reformation's fairly new, so there's not a ton of really well-equipped Protestant leaders. A lot of Protestants, not a ton of educated Protestant theologians, pastors, writers, leaders. And so they call him back to Geneva and say, look, their bishop was trying to take back over. The Catholic bishop was trying to, his name was Spinoza, he was trying to take back over Geneva. And they said, look, you need to come in and we don't know what to do. Like he's saying some things, they're kind of convincing, can you come in and basically re-bolster the Protestant efforts and make sure that we're on the right side of this fence. So Calvin comes in. I actually was assigned this last semester in school. I had to read the letters between Spinoza and Calvin, and it was fascinating. They're very accessible, by the way. They're not like way off the charts uh, intellectual. Uh, you can read them, look them up. The Spinoza letters is what you can look up. But it's fascinating because Spinoza is so kind and really sweet in the first letter. He's like, my dear children in the Lord and in Geneva. You know, he's this really kind, like pastoral, older bishop who's trying to encourage his flock to come back to him, right? Well, after Calvin, ex extremely respectful to the bishop, so respectful, calls him his eminence. He just says, I respect you for your age and for your kindness and for your candor, all this stuff. He's very respectful and then kindly brings up at the end, but the issue remains that we disagree over this spe specific justification. And then... Then the teeth come out. <laughs> Spinoza wasn't quite as sweet after that. Uh, you see the letters get hotter and hotter as they go. <laughs> and then eventually they're, he's like, Rah! you know, like ripping and roaring into Calvin. And then you know, they become widely read and printed. So he does finally come back to Geneva with Pharrell, actually. And in 1555... Uh, the church is finally actually granted control over church discipline. The council says, okay, you've convinced us. You've preached from the Bible a lot. It's clear that the apostles gave this to the church, not to the local administrators. And so they give it back to the church. And now the pastors actually have the ability, if a man or woman is living in open sin, to say, you can't come to the table. You're not identifying as a Christian. And it's not removing their salvation. It's just saying, you might be saved, you might not, but you're not acting like a saved person. And we're not going to publicly stand as a church and say you, that we think you are. And a church, we still do that today. That's what the table is. You know, if you, if you get disciplined at Emmanuel, which it would be a long process, you know, Matthew 18 gives us the process. It's not one decision. If we work with you and talk with you and a man has cheated on his wife and he shows no remorse and we keep talking with him and we're trying to get him to repent and try and restore the family, send them both to counseling, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, no, I just not, I like this new woman. That's how it's going to be. Y'all can move on. Then at some point in time, we come before you, the members, the church, and say, this is what's happened. And Christians don't abandon their spouses. It's that simple. And he's, aban he's abandoning his spouse for another woman. And we're not saying he's not saved. He could still be saved just living in sin. We're just saying he's not acting like he's a believer. 
And so we're going to formally remove him from the table. He's not a member at Emmanuel, and he can't come to the table of the Lord. Now, he can come at his own damnation. I mean, we're not going to physically restrain him. But we're not going to claim him to the outer, broader community. Yeah, he's one of ours. He's a member. He's, he acts just like a Christian. That's church discipline. That's kind of what Calvin rediscovered and took seriously in the Reformation era. So they're given that authority. And then in uh, 1558, he founds what's known as the Geneva Academy. Could go all into the Geneva Academy. I mean, Connor has been there. It's now the university in Geneva or something like that, Geneva University. It's still there today, still stands. Um, not the original building, but the institution. It's a liberal arts college now, though, um, or university. It's not, it doesn't even have a theology department. But it was originally founded um, for the training of men and women, which that was very controversial in Europe. Women weren't really given access to education. Um, uh, Calvin started that trend. And men, women, and, and especially refugees. Um, many refugees from all around the world in Catholic cities who converted to the Protestant faith were persecuted. So they would flee those countries and those cities. And they would come to Geneva. And Geneva would grow and swell in population all the time because of these um, um, refugees. And in, while they were in Geneva, one of the things they could do in Geneva is attend the Geneva Academy. And they could get training in the gospel and theology. And then they would go back out to their surrounding countries and cities. And this is a huge way that the Reformation spreads in the second generation because Lutheranism largely remained inside of Germany. It really didn't have a missionary element until almost two, 300 years later. Um, it mainly stayed inside of Germany. But ref the Reformed branch of Protestantism, uh, it really explodes out of Geneva. Uh, and, and many branches trace their heritage today, literally on the continent of Europe, all the way back to an original Genevan church. Um, many of your grandparents might actually have a very old, old, old copy of a Geneva Bible. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but you can find some really old translations. There was a, a translation translated and printed in Geneva, and it's called the Geneva Bible. It was the Bible that the pilgrims on the Mayflower read when they founded our country, that the early part of the Puritans read, uh, and many people even today in the older generations will keep a Geneva Bible. Some family Bibles are Geneva Bibles. Um, and so there's, that's how much influence the Geneva Academy and that really whole movement had. And then in 1559, finally, 1559, y'all, he completes the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And it's like I said, it's this thick. You should read it. Read one little piece. You can read it almost devotionally because it's just topical. He takes doctrines one at a time and just lay it by your bedside. Read little nuggets of it so you won't understand everything. I don't, but you, you'll understand a lot. It's really good. And then uh, he actually dies on May 27th, uh, 1564 at a very young age, age 55, uh, most people think from tuberculo tuberculosis. And he is buried by his own insistence in a plain wooden coffin and in an unmarked grave. Um, he did not want people to make a monument or anything of him like they had other people in the past, even Martin Luther. Um, and so he, he insisted that he be put in a plain wooden coffin that would decay over time, no vault or anything, and in an unmarked grave. When me and Connor were actually there, I Googled and tried to find his grave. I didn't know this. And I'm looking around and, you know, there's all these different spots around Geneva. It's like a grave of uh, Jean Cavon, you know, and that's all over Geneva. I'm like, well, how many graves does he have? You know, I look it up, and those are all speculated spots that he might be buried, but no one knows because he has no headstone. He refused to be marked, and he didn't want any type of pilgrimage or anything. So he dies much like he lived, a quiet, uh, humble man um, who gave himself largely to his books and the church and his pastoral work. So that's kind of part one, John Calvin. Um, we're going to obviously have question times at the end. The second part of tonight is the Council of Trent, and it's a little heavier. Um, before we go on, I don't want to get lost in the weeds. Anybody got a simple, maybe I misspoke or something. Anybody got a simple question about the first half, the John Calvin half? Anybody, a curiosity or anything you want to ask? I wanted to open it up for questions because it's kind of hard to remember everything at the end. Anybody? Okay, cool. All right, we're going to move on to the second half of tonight, and that is 
the famous or the infamous, you might call, Council of Trent. There's a um, painting of what the council looked like. And uh, it lasted a very long time, as you can see, uh, 1545 to 1563. So this council met on and off for 18 years. Three different popes, two different Holy Roman emperors, uh, hundreds of different cardinals and bishops. Um, it was a long-running process. Um, just to give you some Trent statistics before we dive into the doctrine, um, it's, it, you, it's, it's called by the Catholics an ecumenical church council because they call all their councils that. And you know what ecumenical means. It means the whole church gathers. You know, um, It's everything but an ecumenical council. Okay, it, it's, it was, There were no Reformed invited. There were no Lutherans invited. And there were no Greek Orthodox Christians invited. So all the other major branches of Christianity weren't allowed to come. So it was just Roman Catholics. And then out of that, 70% of the bishops present were Italians. So it wasn't even ethnically diverse like the Roman Catholic Church is. It was mostly Italian, 70%. And the most shocking statistic, out of the over 700 bishops that existed at this time in the Catholic Church. The first meeting that was kicked off at the Council of Trent was opened with 15 bishops. 15 out of 700. Over the next few meetings, it grew into the 20s, 30s, sometimes 40s. The only true largely attended session was the last session, which had 200 bishops present. Still, out of 700, not even a third of the Roman Catholic Church itself was even represented at this ecumenical council. Um, it's supposed to be a council where the whole church gathers like the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chalcedon and all those historic councils we discussed where the whole church gathers like the apostles did and prays together and the Holy Spirit falls upon the bishops and decisions are made. Well, it's also interesting to note that one bishop there said, in the past the Holy Spirit fell upon the bishops and decisions were made. But at Trent, the Holy Spirit comes in the form of a mailbag from Rome. Because there was, there was one legate, the Pope himself never attended the council. But he sent a legate. That just means a representative. He had one legate there, and the legate had sole authority to decide what issues were taken to the floor or not. So the pope, in the form of a mailbag, would mail his legate and inform him what issues to bring to the floor. No other bishops were allowed to speak. And in the whole history of the church, that's never happened. Bishop, any bishop, if you're a bishop, can bring anything to the floor to discuss. Um, because, again, you've got to remember the theology here. You, we have evolved into this season where Rome is the dominant church and its bishop is the dominant bishop. The pope is the, is the infallible head of the church. And you see that played out uh, all through Trent. So we're going to look at uh, Trent in detail. We could spend forever about it. But I want to start with a simple question. Why... You see that first date, 1545, okay? Anybody remember when Luther nailed the 95 Theses, what year? 1517, okay? So the Protestant Reformation got rolling in 1517. In 1520, Luther is, decla is declared, declared a heretic and is excommunicated from the church. Trent meets in 1545, it took them a while, didn't it? So I think a good first question is, why did it take the Roman Catholic Church so long to respond to the Reformation? And there's many answers to this question. The Catholic Church wasn't as organized as it needed to be at this period of time. A lot of corruption. It's also the medieval world, thing, or semi-medieval and Renaissance. Things move slower, right? Everything moves slower, literally. I mean, if you want to communicate with someone, you've got to send somebody on a donkey to go communicate. 
But the main reasons are, are this thing, I'm going to kind of title it, the, you'll see it on your paper, the, da- the dangerous game of counsel is what one pope called it. Uh, why did it take so long for the Catholic Church to call a council to deal with all this Reformation stuff? Well, one pope and the popes had this saying, and they called it the dangerous game of councils. I can't remember who, which pope actually said it. But it was kind of a lingo that popes didn't like councils. Well, I mean, wh- why wouldn't they? It's like if you got everybody from your, all your bishops from all across the world, all in one room, if they all vote you down, it's, it don't matter how much, the, uh, how much false theology you've built up that you're the superior. If everyone in the room outvotes the pope, it's kind of like the pope kind of has to go along with what the church says, you know? Um, and it's, that is easier to do from a distance on a throne than it is to do in a room on a throne, right? If you're all disagreeing with me, and I'm just telling you because I'm your pastor, I'm right, that's easy to do if I mail you all emails separately, and everybody's at home and nobody can fight back, right? But if I get you all in the room, that's a lot harder. Well, councils have become very unpopular by popes. They don't like them. It's this dangerous game of calling a council. Because when you do, you have no clue where that council might go. That council might decide the Pope is no longer infallible. Maybe the Pope needs... You remember the previous council, the Council of Constance, which is what was called to condemn John Huss. What did they also decide at that council? That from now on, the Popes were to call regular councils, remember? And they hadn't been doing that. So whatever pope shows up at this council has to answer to the council on why he's not been called council. <laughs> so, so it's not, if you're the pope, this doesn't sound like an exciting thing to call. People don't like councils. So he's going to do everything he can not to call one. There's other few things at play which I know are going to completely inspire you. Um, the first one, 1523, I know you're going to be shocked, but politics had a lot to do with it. European politics. In 1523, the Holy Roman, actually German, remember, the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy nor Roman. Um, But it was called that because they would march down to Rome and get crowned by the Pope. But it was a German empire, largely. And the German emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, demands a council. Now, anybody remember Charles V? He was also the emperor during what? He was the emperor that presided over Martin Luther's issue. Yeah, the Diet of Worms. So he's Martin Luther's emperor. And he's tired of all this Luther nonsense, Zwingli, and now this Calvin fella. He wants it done. He wants to nip it in the bud. So he demands, as the Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful man in Europe at the time, he demands from the Pope that the Pope call a council. Well, the Pope doesn't want to call a council for several reasons. One, councils are dangerous. Two... There is a political war right now at this season of history. I know you're shocked. Between the kingdom of France, the Holy Roman Empire, and the Pope. They are vying for power in Europe. Okay? The Holy Roman Empire currently is the dominant force and has been for a while. But France is a large chunk of area. And France is beginning to develop the early forms of a national identity. And they don't really like being ruled by this Holy Roman Emperor dude. And the French kings have, have this long history of ruling France. So they're beginning to develop independence, and they kind of want to push the Holy Roman Emperor out. They're all Catholic. But, and then you got down in Italy, you got the Pope, who has been on this tirade for centuries now of wanting to basically rule a Catholic empire. So you got the Pope wanting more independence from the Holy Roman Emperor, because Germany, you know, is right above Italy. And you got France wanting to fight. So you got these three people fighting. France, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the Pope. So why do you think there's another reason that the Pope doesn't want to call a council? Well, it's actually because he, he is scared of strengthening Charles' power by subduing the Protestant problem. Think about it. Charles can't raise all of his full strength because half his princes are now Lutherans. And they ain't going to come fight for him if he doesn't give them their independence to believe what they want to believe. 
So he's dealing with this Protestant problem. So he can't raise large sections of his Germanic states. He can't raise armies from them because they won't send him armies because he hasn't given them freedom yet. So what does that do? That splits the Holy Roman Empire. It makes the emperor weak. And the pope likes that. Because he can push his boundaries a little further up into Germany. Right now, the Holy Roman Empire rules all the way into what's called Lombardia, which was the, the top part of Italy, not far at all from Rome. The, 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 the Pope wants as much land as he can get. He'd love to push some of those lands back. So why call a council and end all this Protestant nonsense when the Protestants are kind of, they're kind of making the emperor weak and me and the French king can kind of do our own thing. So some politics are at play. He doesn't want to, he likes that Charles' position is, is weakened. Well, Charles was a wise and a very capable ruler. So on May 6th, 1527, Charles invades Rome. He decides to just take his military force, and he, he can't really deal with France right now. He said, but the Pope ain't got much to defend himself, so he marches his entire force down to Rome. He invades Rome, and the Pope barely escapes with his life. I think he had to crawl over a wall and be smuggled out somehow. I mean, he literally almost died. And so Charles sets up shop in Rome, and this is a huge display of power on behalf of Charles. And he's like, look, I mean business. You, first of all, you're not going to outsmart me. I'll come down here and kill you and make a new pope. I'm the, I'm the boss, okay, <laughs> like his ancestors. And he's very serious as well that this council gets called. He's ready for it to happen. He's, he, he's a good Catholic, and he wants everybody in Germany to be a good Catholic, and he's done with all this Lutheran nonsense. So he's going to have his way uh, either way. So it's interesting. Uh, one historian summarized this whole era this way. Between the bull, y'all remember what a bull was. It's not like the animal. A papal bull is a document. That's all it is. It's like, a, it's like kicking somebody out of the church. It was called uh, excursion domine. It was the thing to excommunicate Martin Luther. Between that bull excommunicating Martin Luther in June 1520 and the convening of the Council of Trent in December 1545, 25 years passed because the papacy feared calling a council that it could not control. Uh, it's kind of the best example of the cat is literally out of the bag at this point. Like... <laughs> They had the opportunity to probably squash Protestantism early on. But, you know, you let something exist for 25 years, it's kind of hard to really reel it all back in at that point. So Trent is interesting to say the least. But what makes it most relevant for you as a Christian is what we're about to talk about. Three main things. They dealt with three main things. Now, if you read, don't ever read Trent because talk about boring. <laughs> I actually had to read it last parts of it last semester. It's like page upon page upon page upon page of things you can't half understand, and it's kind of written that way on purpose. Um, there's, there's doctrinal statements and then what they call canons, which are like shortened versions of the doctrinal statement. So a doctrinal statement literally might be that long, and half of it might be one sentence. They, they do comma, 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 colon, comma, comma, comma. And I'm like, good night. And so you're following logic upon logic upon logic. You can't hardly understand it. And then you get to a summary, and the summary is about as bad. So when you weed through it all and you do the hard work of really trying to understand what they were talking about, three main things emerge at Trent, and we're going to talk about them. First of all, structural reform. They're going to rearrange the Catholic Church some. That's, the, that's one of the main things. Second of all, the doctrine of Scripture and third of all, the doctrine of justification. Don't let those slip your mind. That is Trent, okay? That is the things that should be of interest to you as a Protestant. Is structural reforms are important, but especially these two main doctrines. They're going to further articulate what is still today the modern, current, binding position of the Roman Catholic Church on these two doctrines to this day. Now, Vatican II added things and softened a lot of language back in the 70s. Was it the 70s? Um, but th they didn't recant Trent because that would be admitting that they're fallible. <laughs> so they left Trent in place. So Trent is still binding even today. So keep those three in mind. Let's look at those. Number one, the structural reforms. So as you remember, 
the, the church is very corrupt at this time, right? Everyone knows that. Simony, anybody know what simony is? Simony is the selling of church offices. Remember in Acts, Simon, um, the, uh, um, what's he called? Yeah, Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer is getting money to do miracles and stuff like that. That's, it was named after him. It's called simony. It's the selling of church offices. Simony was rampant, and bishops at this point in time were rarely in their parishes. So you could literally buy a bishopric. If you're wealthy enough and you wanted some passive income, you could get out a loan and buy a bishopric. And you didn't even have to live in your bishopric. You could buy the bishopric of Louisiana and stay here in North Carolina. But because you owned a bunch of land as the bishop, you received passive income from your lands in Louisiana. So the best way to be wealthy was to get enough loans or have enough collateral to buy a bunch of bishoprics. And then you could retire. <laughs> Sounds great, doesn't it? Uh, this was rampant in this day and time. Well, even the Catholics, when they all got together, realized, okay, this is ridiculous. Like, the whole world is making fun of us. Like, Jesus would never sell a position in the church. The apostles would never sell a position in the church. So, they obviously decide that this is an issue. Another thing, immorality among the clergy was commonplace. It wasn't, except, it wasn't rare. It was commonplace. Most bishops had some... Children in the community, everyone knew they were their children. The, do you know, who, <laughs> you know who had the most? I think there was one pope who had um, like 15 children from six different women. It was something ridiculous. The popes had more progeny than like some of the nobles in the area. Uh, the popes would, would assign their children to bishoprics. I mean, it's messed up stuff. And they would just get, you know, absolution for their sins. So this immorality was normal. It's like if you're a bishop, you know, you're supposed to take a vow of celibacy, but everybody really knows, you know, you can't really do that. So you, you can't marry, but you can have a concubine. You can have some side action, you know. It's ridiculous. You know, we laugh at it now. But it was normal in that day and time. So I know you're going to be shocked, but the, the reformers obviously railed all this stuff against the Catholic Church. Well, when the Catholic Church meets at Trent, they decide that they're going to vigorously reject these practices and they sought to bring the church in line. So the church, this is a positive of Trent. Uh, Post-Trent, the Catholic Church, become, to about the modern era, the Catholic Church becomes extremely strict on some of these rules. Extremely strict. They're like, look, if we're going to take vows of poverty and vows of celibacy, it all falls apart if we don't keep the vows. Everybody just makes fun of us. We're a bunch of idiots. We, look like we're not, we don't look like Christians. We don't seem like we follow Jesus. It's all corrupt. So nobody disputes that the Catholic Church was a, 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 a poo show in, in medieval Europe. Nobody disputes that, not even Catholics. This is a Catholic historian, John O'Malley. He says, the heart of Tridentine reform, Tridentine is, means Trent, the heart of Tridentine reform was basically to get bishops and pastors back home to do their job. Like the real core of Trent, and you'll see it in the canons, is they're like, look, if we're going to be Christians, Catholics, good Catholics, we're going to have to actually obey the rules. If you're a bishop and you never come to your bishopric, you ain't going to be a bishop anymore. You ha you're required to come to your bishop bishopric and check on every one of your uh, priest that you have there, and every at some point you have to see and be proximity with every one of your parishioners. So this is going to majorly change the Catholic Church. You know, you got guys living in other countries; they can't do that anymore. They got to be at their bishoprics. Uh, immorality is got really strict. If you're, you can be defrocked now if you're caught having a concubine or having illegitimate children. So Rome cranks down the dial, and they are going to stand up against all of this debauchery. So we can actually, as Protestants, we can celebrate this part of Trent. At least they're trying to step up to what they claim. Um, and I would say we have seen reforms in our own lifetime in the Catholic Church. Um, remember all the sex scandals of the priesthood in America, right? We've seen the current pope finally... Uh, take some aggressive stances on those things. We can celebrate stuff like that when they actually finally step up and put an end to something terrible that they've been doing. It's the same with Trent. Uh, this was a shame across the whole world. Um, the Muslim world looked on at the Catholic world. It was embarrassing. I mean, 
The Muslim world wasn't perfect. They had their own issues, but they were largely more devout than your average European Catholic. Um, and so this is a positive that Trent is going to change some of the structural and moral things about the Catholic Church. And look, if it stopped there, and that was the only thing that the reformers had a problem with was all the debauchery, then this would have been a huge win. And we might all still be one church. It would be great. But sadly, it didn't stop there. Let's look at number two. The doctrine of Scripture. The doctrine of Scripture. They talk about this extensively. Um, let's talk first about Scripture and authority. Anybody ever heard of the Apocrypha? Okay. The Apocrypha is a set of books that was penned in between Malachi and Matthew. The intermediary period of the Testaments. It was penned by everybody from people like rabbis, uh, devout sects of Jews like the Maccabees. Um, they pen these and collect these documents. Well, the early church never trusted the Apocrypha. Now, they read the Apocrypha and they found the Apocrypha interesting. But the Apocrypha is never attested to by the apostles. Um, the Apocrypha has blatant errors and contradictions in it, especially historic errors. And it contradicts the Bible in multiple places. And you don't see any of the apostles, early church, or Jesus appealing to the Apocrypha authoritatively. And the early Jews did not see the Apocrypha as authoritative. When they sent, translated the Septuagint, they did not translate the Apocrypha. It was translated completely separately. Um, so the Jews didn't see the Scripture, Jesus didn't see the Scripture, the apostles didn't see the Scripture, and the early church didn't see the Scripture. Well, as you can imagine, over the thousands of years, a lot of these stray random doctrines that the Catholic Church had developed, for instance, like purgatory, has some things that you might could hint at being true from some apocryphal sources. Well, now all of a sudden... The Catholic Church has a vested interest in making the Apocrypha the same level of Scripture. So they actually do that. The Apocrypha is added at the Council of Trent as authoritative along with Scripture due to its connection with purgatory and other beliefs. Now, I would tell you, I don't think the Apocrypha, the Apocrypha is secretly satanic. Okay, uh, You can read the Apocrypha. But you just need to know that you, we ain't got a clue 100% who wrote it. There's a few of them we do know who wrote. But it's just like any old book you'd read. They're interesting. We actually have some modern hymns that are based on one section of the Apocrypha, the, out of the Maccabees. There's some beautiful stuff where they're just people praying to the Lord and writing it down. But there's also the Book of Enoch. Very weird book. Very strange book. Um, not entirely sure who wrote it, right? Uh, where it came from, how old it is. And... All of these things kind of converge to just make it pretty clear that this is not inspired Holy Scripture. These are extra books, apocryphal as books. And so the, 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 actual, the, the Council of Trent seems to think that it would be an advantage for the Roman Catholic Church to now officially put the Apocrypha on the same level as Scripture. Now, you've got to get how crazy this is. This is in 15-something, okay? So they're deciding all these years later against all the early church councils that never voted on this. None of the, the early church can, canon was never, ever apocryphal. They're deciding in the 1500s that all of a sudden this is Scripture. Y'all not find that crazy? And anyway, we can keep going. We'll, we'll skip that. So they put the apocrypha on the standard with Scripture. Um, scripture and what they called unwritten traditions. That's a fancy way of saying something interesting. <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying stuff we made up. Okay, uh, un, unwritten traditions. The the reformers had an issue with all these things that had made their way into the church. Okay, you have Lent. You have the church calendar. In Lent, you can't eat sausages or meat. Uh, you got to gender flect, and you've got to do the sign of the cross. You got to touch and kiss the uh, the doorway a certain way. You got to bow before the priest. You got to look up at the tabernacle, and you got to gender flect it before you go and sit down. You got, I mean, all these things that have evolved. And they were just, I don't think they were wicked. They were just little additions over time. Addition, addition. You know the sign of the cross? What's wrong with that? It just makes the shape of the cross. Let's just do that. The early church kind of did that to identify themselves in secret. We'll adopt that. And look, not very evil, but 
Now you have to do it, right? Well, then there's another thing added, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. And now half y'all could go to a Catholic Mass and not know what in the heck is going on. You wouldn't have a clue because you have to have a whole separate education to even know what anything means. And it's fascinating. Like some of it's interesting. Like my, my aunt's Catholic, and uh, she walked me through what everything means. And I'm like, good glory. How do y'all remember all this stuff? You know, that means this, and this means that, and that means this. and blah, blah, blah. It's this, this tradition, these unwritten traditions, because none of this stuff is in the Bible. None of this stuff is in, written by the apostles. So many of the traditions and practices of Catholicism are now claimed under this banner of oral traditions as passed down, get this, Trent claims, by Christ and the apostles themselves. I'm going to read you a section from Trent. Look at this. These truths concerning the gospel and rules are contained in the written books. Okay, that's the Bible. And in the unwritten traditions, which received by the apostles from the mouth of Christ himself or from the apostle themselves, the Holy Ghost dictating have come down to us, transmitted, as it were, from hand to hand. Since God is the author of both testaments, also he is the author of the traditions, whether they relate to faith or to morals, as having been dictated either orally by Christ or by the Holy Ghost and preserved in the Catholic Church in unbroken, unbroken succession. So what are they doing? They're writing themselves a blank check here. Anything the Catholic Church decides is a tradition has been passed down orally by Christ and the Apostles. Although everyone, including all the people in the room, know that's bogus. Because you can go back in history and half the stuff they're doing in medieval Europe at the time in their liturgies, they didn't do 800 years before and 800 years before that, even less. All the way to today, the stuff you do in Catholic worship today would be so different than what they did in the 1500s. It constantly grows. But because Trent claims that it is all passed down by the Holy Ghost preserved in the Catholic Church in unbroken succession, the Catholic Church now gets to decide what is on the same par as Scripture. So Scripture is great. Now the Apocrypha is great. It's inspired by God. And now, now you've got to realize this is in the 1500s. No council has ever said anything like this before now. But now in the 1500 years after the apostles have died, they say that the Holy Ghost itself undergirds the decisions of the Catholic Church and makes them infallible. So all the Orthodox, poor fellas, they're gone. They're just, whoop, you know, the Orthodox, are, they're out, a whole branch of Christianity. And all the Protestants are out. So the only branch that is the true, guided by the Holy Spirit, passed down by the Apostles branch, is the Roman Catholic branch of Christianity. So that's, that's Scripture. Let's look, lastly, tonight at justification. The most important one. Everyone breathe. Re-engage your brains. This is definitely the most important part. The doctrine of justification. I would rather you disagree about a thousand other things than get this confused. Because this is either saving or not saving stuff. So let's look at the doctrine of justification. Sadly, Trent confuses and misunderstands the Protestant view of justification. There are sections, if you go read Trent, for those of you that are really bored, if you go read parts of Trent, there's parts of it that will sound very Protestant. You're like, oh, that seems good. You'll read other parts that, oh, they get us. Then you'll read other parts, and you're like, that's not what we mean by that. Wait, wait a second, what? You, you, almost be, you almost feel at times befuddled. Because you'll read it and go, maybe this writer is really intelligent and has a deeper understanding of Protestantism than I do as a Protestant. And I want to tell you, that's not true. You need to realize, first of all, we're talking about 20 bishops sitting in a room writing this stuff. 
at the best 200 bishops out of 700, all of them predominantly Italians, okay? Guess what? Few bishops at the council itself had even read the reformers firsthand. These men hadn't even read the Institutes of the Christian Religion. They hadn't read the Augsburg Confession. They hadn't read Martin Luther's short catechism. They don't even know firsthand what the Protestants are actually trying to say. They're hearing it second and third hand. And remember, most of them are Italian. What was Martin Luther? German. What was John Calvin? He was French. What was Zwingli? He was Swiss. No Italians, okay? So whatever, whatever they do read, if they don't read those languages, they have to get translated. They don't have interest in this. So you're not talking about honest bishops. Now, some of, them, some of the bishops at Trent were some decent men. They actually, there was a bish, two or three bishops that objected to the Scripture section. There were a few bishops that objected to the Justification section. But predominantly, most of them, they didn't care to read. They're there politically motivated to shut down this Protestant nonsense. They're not there to act. They're not real intellects, actual acad ac academic minded bishops that love the Bible, that want to sit down and study and see if these Protestant people are actually heretics or not. Most of them had never even read the documents. And that's where you get stuff like this. Some of them were confused on the teaching of justification. Apparently, and this has become somewhat laughable in the Roman Catholic world um, because modern Catholics understand us much better than the Catholics at Trent. But, for instance, here's a quote from Trent. This is one of the canons, and the way a canon, don't read it yet, the way a, can, <clears throat> the way a canon works is it gives you a doctrinal statement and it ends with, it starts with, if anybody says or believes this, it ends with, they are anathema, they're accursed. They're not Christian. They're out of the fold. They're cursed. They're going to hell, basically. And that's how, this is one of those canons. Tell me if this makes sense to you as a Protestant. If anyone saith that a man is truly absolved from his sins and justified because that he assuredly believed himself absolved and justified, or that no one is truly justified but he who believes himself justified, let him be anathema. So what they're saying is, any, if, if you believe that you're justified based off how much you believe in the fact that you're justified? That's anathema. Well, is that what Protestantism is? Do, do we stand around and preach about the harder you believe it, the more saved you are? That, that's how you get saved. You have to be 100% convinced that you're justified. And when you are, then you're justified. It's nonsense. Like, we don't even believe that. Well, they had misconstrued the idea of faith and the emphasis the reformers put on faith with it sounding like an action, a thing that you, you are putting all your confidence in knowing that you... And look, you might have heard some of this langu language today. Have you ever heard knowing that you know that you know that you know that you know? You know, I've, I heard that growing up. That's the idea that what faith really is is 100% surety. It's not the, what is, our, what is our faith actually in? Is it in the strength of our faith, church? It's in the object of our faith and his strength. And who's that? Jesus. Our faith is not in our faith. My faith's pretty weak, and it ebbs and flows. Our faith, the apostles themselves said, we believe, but help our unbelief. We've got some unbelief still. So it's not, it's, you're not saved by the strength of your faith. And so guess what? You can agree with this. I, any idiot that says the strength of how much you believe you're justified and saved is what makes you justified and saved is nonsense. And it's not the Protestant position. It just goes later on, historians look at this, and it's, it goes to show you how disconnected the Catholic world was the elite Italian Catholic world, from the Protestant world. 
They weren't reading that stuff. They were in their own country, their own area, doing their own thing, their own politics. They weren't really interested in understanding John Calvin and understanding Martin Luther and understanding Zwingli. They were more interested in their own thing. So they misunderstand us majorly. And then they understand us in the second part and majorly disagree. This is the sad part. I, I'm actually more comfortable with the, the un, misunderstanding because I can come to a Catholic and say, which they don't believe this now. They've cleared a lot of this up. But you can come to a Tridentine Catholic and say, hey, you really miss, you missed a boat here. That's not what I meant by what I say when I'm talking about faith. Okay, But this second part is the sadder part. It's the part where we truly actually disagree. So question, what causes justification? Let me put it to it this way. Is the cause of justification faith or the sacraments? What is the, another way of saying it, what is the ground of your confidence that you are in Christ? What is the foundation? When you go and search for confidence that you're saved, that you are regenerate, that you're going to be, like we read at the beginning of our lesson tonight, that you're going to be saved from the wrath of God. What is the grounds of that confidence? Is, is it the strength of your faith like we just discussed? No, that's going to be very depressing because sometimes you'll have strong faith, sometimes you'll have weak faith. Is it the sacraments? You observing the system of the church? If you've, if you've repented recently? if you've prayed properly, if you've done penance, if you've been to confession, if you have taken the Lord's Supper? What is it? This is a major disagreement. Look in session 6 of Trent. They said this. The grace of justification once received, okay, received. So the Catholic doctrine is when you've been justified, you can be justified, made right with God at your baptism. Once received is lost. Okay? So you can lose your justification. It's lost not only by apostasy, which is walking away and saying you don't believe anymore, by which faith itself is lost. They don't have faith anymore. But also by any other, you ever heard this before, mortal sins? This has been preached for a while in the Catholic communion but never codified by a council as Catholic doctrine that there are venial and mortal sins. Y'all know what a venial and mortal sin is? Venial sins are everyday sins you can commit and still go to heaven. They're little sins, like Jesse's saying. You might have to say a rosary or you know, do a few things, go to church, and it'll wipe out those sins. But mortal sins are sins that can actually send you to hell. So the Catholic system works like this. You get, you get saved at your baptism. You place faith in Christ, and they take it very literally what the apostle says that you have to be baptized. Baptized and believe and be saved. So we would say, obviously, the connection to Christ there is the belief. The baptism is a command. And you should be baptized, by the way. I would never advise you not to be baptized because uh, you're disobeying Christ's actual command. But that's not the salvific element. You're, ba you're baptized and you believe because Christ is the one that saves. So in the Catholic communion, when you are claim faith and baptized, then in that moment there's a literal washing away of all your sins. You have no more sins. You're, you have a blank slate before God. But here's the problem. Every time you then sin, you mar your record before God in the Catholic system. So, and on that scale, there are little sins that they call venial sins that when you commit them like you might have cussed at the, at the dude that, that cut you off. That's a venial sin. You said a bad word. Jesse does those a lot. <laughs> no, you, 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 do a, you do a venial, a little sin, just kind of a, you told a white lie at work, okay? You fibbed on a, on a this or that. Um, you took a piece of candy from the, the dollar store. Those are little sins, okay? And the way you make those right, they're on your record, and, the, and they, they interfere with you and God. But all you really need to do is tell a priest, and, 
and maybe pray the rosary, go to church a few times, and that kind of wipes that away again, and you get what's called absolution. You ever got absolution, Jesse? You ever had absolution? They absolve you. They, they tell you that you're forgiven. So you get absolution, and then you're good. But there are some sins that are so bad that when you commit them, you actually lose your standing as justified before the Father. Your salvation's gone. They include murder, adultery, um, what's the, what are the other ones? Can't remember. There's seven, seven deadly sins, right? Um, what are the venial sins? I can't remember. There's a lot of, there's several of them. I think there's six or seven. But basically, it's a sin that the second you commit it, you have now so marred your relationship between God. If you don't go and do absolution, or you do confession, absolution, penance, you got to do whatever the Catholic priest tells you to make it right. Which, if you commit something like adultery, it can be a lot. And then you can be restored and absolved. Then, if you don't do that and you die, you go to hell. Did y'all hear what I just said? Like, that's not good news. That's very... Where is your confidence in that? And what do you do with Jesus' view of morality with that? When he says to hate someone is to murder them. You ever got angry and hated someone for a flicker in your heart? Well, you're a murderer, according to Jesus. That's not, that, that means you're disconnected from the Father, and you've got to do a lot to get things right, because if you die, you're going to hell if you're a Catholic. So they develop this, and they, they codify this at Trent. Any mortal sin, though faith is not lost. So you might still believe in God, but because you've committed a mortal sin, you have to go through the process to be made right, or if you die, you go to hell. So you can die as a Catholic. This is why y'all ever heard uh, anybody grow up hearing, it's a general myth in the West, that suicide is like the ultimate sin. If you commit suicide, you go to hell. Do y'all know where that came from? It came from medieval Catholic theology. That's literally where it came from. Because what is a, one of the mortal sins? Murder. What is suicide? It's the murder of yourself. You're murdering yourself. You're taking a, a life. So if you die in the act of murdering, you don't have any chance to restore it through penance. And so you go to hell. No, no room for error there. No room for being sick or depressed or any of those things. If, you're, if, you, if you commit suicide, you go to hell. That's where this came from. It's a mortal sin. And this is all codified for the first time at Trent. So our last slide, I kind of, I almost didn't put this in here. Because I don't want you to get lost in the weeds. But I think it's helpful because it really highlights one major, the main departure. And look, I'm going to be honest with you. What I'm about to talk about, it's a little weird. I don't really get it. I don't know what the Catholic connection with the sacraments is and their obsession with it. I don't know. But in this era, uh, Aristotle developed a way, it's called... Um, Causality. It's, it's a way to evaluate things based off multiple causes. Don't get lost in that. It's the way ancients thought about stuff. Okay, I'm going to give you a graph, and we're going to compare Aristotle. They did this in this day and time. Uh, John Calvin did one, and Trent did one. They, they did this comparison between what Trent taught and what Calvin and the Protestants taught. Okay, This, this is what I'm telling you about causality. Uh, Aristotle called it the final cause, the efficient cause, the material cause, and the instrumental cause. I know you're thinking like, what? To put it simple, it's like the goal of something, the source of something, the substance of that something, and the means by which that substance is given. Okay, It'll make sense as we talk. So they did this in this era, era on the doctrine of justification. So this is what Trent taught was the the goal of justification, the source of justification, the substance of justification, and the means, the way it is transmuted, it's trans, transferred. And this is what Calvin taught. Now, I want you to compare these with me. So the first one, what's the final end goal, the final cause, the ultimate cause of why justification exists? Well, Trent says, the glory of God and of Christ. Okay? Calvin and the Reformers say the praise of God's goodness. Pretty much the same thing. We agree there, right? So the ultimate cause of justification, the only reason you're saved, church, 
the ultimate cause is because God is good. And the Catholics believe that. The goodness, of, the, the glory of God, the glory of His goodness, however you want to phrase that, it's ultimately because of God. He wants to save sinners, and that's why you're able to be saved. That's the ultimate source. So we agree here. Both the same. Next. What, what, what Aristotle called the efficient cause, the source. Where does it really come from? The ability to justify someone. Where does it, what's its source? What does it flow out of? At Trent, they said the God of mercy. His abundant mercy is why he can justify sinners. Calvin and the Reformers, the mercy of the Heavenly Father. Basically the same thing. These are direct quotes. So we got agreement here again. Where does our justification flow from? It's from God's abundant mercy. The, only re the source is that God has so much mercy to give you and me. He's just got oceans of it, and that's how he can justify terrible sinners. So we agree there. <clears throat> the next one he called material cause or the substance. What is it actually? So this is where it comes from. How, what, what, it, what is the substance of it? What's the way it's accomplished? Okay, Trent said, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the thing that accomplishes your justification. He's the way. So it's from God's goodness and flows out of his mercy, but the thing that does it is Jesus and his work. What does Calvin and the Reformers say? The mercy of the Heavenly Father. Basically the same thing. I mean, sorry, I skipped. Christ and his obedience. These are basically the same thing. So, so far, we agree. Trent agrees with the... the and then you get to this one. What, what is the means... Because Jesus is not here. The substance is not here currently. He left. He's gone. So what's the modern means right now, in this moment? How do you access that justification? And the two answers are so polar opposite. It's insane. At Trent, it's the sacrament of baptism. And for Calvin and the Reformers, it's through faith. Faith is the thing that binds us to Christ who came flowing out of God's mercy for his ultimate glory. So we agree on all this, but the, the actual, the, the, the means of, of, of grace itself is for the Protestant, faith alone. It's faith. It's the fact that what I read at the beginning tonight, why did I start that way? What does he say? Romans 3, 28. He says, for we, him and the apostles, hold that one is justified by faith. Not uh, apart from works of the law. It's pretty straightforward. The apostles taught that we're justified through faith. Through our trust in what God has done in Christ. And Tridentine theology, Catholic theology said, ultimately, your access point into that justification are the sacraments of the church. You have to be baptized. You have to be in good standing so you can regularly take the supper. You have to have absolution and confession. And you have to do penance. And if you don't do those things consistently and regularly, then you will die outside of the faith. Where is, how do you even know if you're being a good... What does a good Catholic even mean? How, I go to Mass once a week, and I mean, how often do you do penance? You know, to, what I'm trying to get you to see is there's no security in any of that. There's no security. There's, did, did you find, don't speak, but did you find it secure when you were a Catholic, Jesse? Did you feel secure? We have two very uh, prominent Catholics who used to be Catholic. If you ever have Catholic siblings, if you, there's no security and safety and comfort in the Catholic sacerdotal system. Because you're on, you're on this journey of if you're close to God or far from God or close to God or far from God. And I, I, I want to say, many of you are thinking, well, that's not really relevant to us today because none of us are Catholic and there's not a lot of Catholics around here. Well, let me tell you something. Catholic theology has found its way into the mainstream Protestant American church in the form of many other doctrines we'll talk about later. 
But this view of salvation, although we don't have the Roman Catholic sacraments anymore, we have our own sacraments. I was raised in a culture where you get saved and you're right with God. And if you sin, oh, you're not so right with God. And now I've got to do some things to make sure me and God are okay. So I'm going to read my Bible today, pray a little bit, go to church youth group, knock on some doors, <laughs> go to choir. And then, oh, I sinned again back down here, disrespecting my mom. Now I'm really bad. And then I'll pray some. I'll reach. I mean, we just didn't have great sacraments. Our sacraments were basically prayer, Bible reading, youth camp, choir, church attendance on Sunday. You know, that's about it. Patch the pirate little icons, um, Awana, whatever. And then we had adult versions of that too. How much money you gave to the church, how involved your, your family was at church. We do this as humans. It's not a Catholic. You don't need to be busting on the Catholics. This is human theology. It's not really just Catholic theology. You think that God is like you. That there's this ebb and flow of his love for you. And that he sees you some ways sometimes when you offend him and other ways at other times and there's this back and forth. But what the, what, what the, reformer, <clears throat> the reformers rediscover was that if we're justified through faith then, and his righteousness is imputed, what they called it, it was a forensic declaration. So it's not a process like the Catholics said that you can go in and out of. You have to work with grace along this journey and then hopefully one day you'll be saved. In the Reformation, they discovered that it's not a process. Justification is an event. It's a moment. It is a forensic, which means legal. It's a legal binding declaration that you are now seen in God's court as Jesus is seen. And Jesus on the cross is now seen as you are seen. And all of your sins, past, present, and future, are washed away under the tidal wave of the blood of the Lamb. And they're gone. And you go, I know some of you, I can see it in your eyes. I feel the same way. That sounds just, maybe the Catholics felt this way in the Middle Ages. That just sounds a little too good to be true. That sounds like so mind-blowing that a God could do something like that. And the question is always what they ask Paul. Well, then, does it matter? We can just live however we want, right? Well, no, that's not the point. It's the radicalness of that love. That God doesn't come to you and require you to work to him. He actually works infinitely downwards to you. And he takes all the costs on himself, not you. It is the radicalness of that love that invades the human heart and changes you. And you actually start loving God and loving others. And then the out external things begin to change. But see, Protestantism, I hope you're realizing it. I hope that we're getting somewhere with this. Protestantism is really beginning to be almost an entirely different type of religion than Catholicism. They have very similar names, a lot of overlap, and I would even say with post-Vatican II, we have a little bit more in common than we did in this era, just a little, like a hair more. <laughs> but they're really two different ways of seeing God and two different ways of seeing you. And that in no way, I mean, I'm probably the most pro-Catholic Protestant you'll meet. I like Catholic people. I love Catholics. I have family that's Catholic. I think, I think it's very culturally cool. You know, I like to see all the stuff and the beautiful cathedrals and the art. I think that's great. But the good news is that you don't have to live under that burden of that sacerdotal system not knowing where you are on the spectrum with God. You can know in faith that you're completely restored to the Father because Jesus Christ, your elder brother, has stood in on your behalf. And at the end of the day, this is what the Reformation is actually about. We can get over all the other stuff you argue about. We can even get over if you like the Apocrypha or not. But we can't, we can't move beyond this justification issue. Because those are really two ways of saving someone. They're either saved through faith and then changed by sanctification, which is a work of the Spirit. Or they are saved... And then maintain their salvation by cooperating with the Holy Spirit 
on this journey, this sacerdotal, sacramental journey. It's two views of salvation. 